Well, good morning, Element Church. So good to be with you guys in this space. And man, we are expectant to hear from God this morning. And we are in a season of 21 days of prayer where we're meeting with him and just want to continue to encourage you to come along on the journey with us. Hey, if you are in a social media platform this morning where you can say good morning or hello or let us know who you are and where you're joining in from, we would love for you to do that. Go ahead and uh, throw it in there. We would love to say good morning to you, but we need you to throw the chat in the thing, uh, the comments, whatever, whatever platform you're on. Just say good morning. We'd love to hear from you. And if you've never connected with us before, text the keyword element to 97,000. That's element to 97,000. And let us know who you are. We'd love to connect with you, but we can't do that unless you write us first. So, hey, say good morning on the on the social media thread and then let us know who you are. And if you've been with us before, welcome back, guys. Isn't this cool that we get to be in this space together? And I'm expecting this morning that God is going to speak to our hearts in a huge way. Why? You say, why? How come? Because we're going to encounter God's word. And when we encounter God's word, it's not just that we read it, it's that it reads us and it changes us. And so very excited to do that this morning. A couple quick uh, events that are happening. We're in the middle of 21 days of prayer, as I said, and you can join with us in person or online right from wherever you are. So everybody watching, you can join 21 days of prayer. Monday through Friday, 7 to 8 a.m. Eastern time. You can join with us on a Zoom call. If you'd like that information, we need you to join and we'll send you that info. You can go to our website, theelement.church backslash 21 days. There's also, it's right in the main browser bar. There's also a button on the main uh, homepage. If you scroll, it's just right there under the main kind of header video. And then also on our app, which if you've not downloaded our app, make sure that you do that. It's free wherever apps can be downloaded on all the social, uh, on all the different types of phones, but uh, make sure that you download that. There's tons of cool stuff on there, but one of the things that you can do is you can actually click the 21 days of prayer tile and it'll get you to the same place. Um, Request to join the group and we'll send you all the information about how you can join with us for 21 days of prayer. This is the last week, you guys. This is the third week and we're very, very excited about that. And hey, we always like to do this at the end of 21 days of prayer. We do that twice a year. We always do a baptism service. And so we are doing one uh, after next week. And so if you would like to be baptized or you know someone who would like to be baptized, you can text baptisms with an S. Make sure you put the S on there because someone else has the keyword baptism. You, you can get baptized. I'll just be at a different church. I don't, we can't help you. So make sure you text baptisms to 97,000 and you can sign up to be baptized. We're really excited to do that. Um, Let's see, what else do I have on here for you guys this morning? If you uh, would like to lead an e-group here at Element Church, you can actually do that online, um, but we need you to sign up for the group. So you can go to our e-groups page, and there's actually a button there that says uh, 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 create a group, um, lead a group. I, I can't remember what the exact thing is, but you'll see it on there. I believe it says create a group, and you can do that. The deadline's August 28th, so make sure that if you have an interest in doing that, make sure you fill out that form beforehand. We'll reach out to you touch base with you on that. Guys, there's four ways you can give here. Uh, You can give online, theelement.church backslash give. You can uh, give on the app. You can text an amount to 84321, or you can mail the PO Box 52, East Lansing, Michigan, 48826. We always like to let you know a little bit about what your giving's doing. And this past week, Pastor Eric and I were able to host at our personal home, we were able to host a grill and chill for the MSU campus ministry leaders. So uh, it is a, a group of uh, the ministry leaders at Michigan State, and we just invited all of them uh, that we could find to our house. And so we had about 20 people there, you guys. It was great. We just sat around a campfire in the back. We uh, we talked, we chatted, we ate hot dogs and hamburgers. We ate a lot of dessert and ice cream, and we talked about Jesus, and we talked about college students, and we talked about doing ministry, and we shared stories, and we talked about faith, and we talked about grit, and uh, we talked about how we're all on the same team. And, uh, and so it was just amazing. It was an amazing time. So I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of you who give. You guys just invested in a bunch of MSU ministry leaders this week. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of Pastor Eric and I's hearts. We love you guys. We're so thankful for you, and we're so thankful for your continued partnership with Element Church. It's making a difference in a lot of different places. So thank you. You guys, we're continuing our series today called How to Pray, and we're going to talk on week three or part three here about uh, a little uh, acronym, PRAY, is, is P-R-A-Y. It's pause, rejoice, ask, and yield, or yes. Uh, you could change that in if you, if you like that better. And so today we're going to talk about the first two letters, P and R, pause and rejoice. So really excited to get into that. Get your Bibles, get your notebooks, ask the Holy Spirit to enter the space where you are. Let me pray over us and we'll get into God's word this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come and gather around your word this morning. 
We thank you for the power of your word and your presence. God, I pray your presence over whatever space every single person is in right now. God, anyone within the sound of my voice, God, wherever they are, Holy Spirit, would you just descend into the place? Would you meet them in a real way today? And would you just open your word? Would you inspire them, encourage them, establish them as they lean in and they listen for your voice today? We thank you for that, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome, you guys. Let's get into God's word together this morning, How to Pray, part three. Well, you guys, we are in the middle of a series called How to Pray, and we're in part three today, and we are talking about this uh, little kind of thing of remembrance for prayer, which is P-R-A-Y, which is pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. And today we're going to talk about the first two parts of that, which is pause and rejoice. As we get into this, I want to remind us that uh, the book that we've been reading actually reminds us to keep it real, keep it simple, and keep it up. And that as we pray, those are three good parameters for us is to keep it real, to keep it simple, and to keep it up. That's how we pray. That's how we do this. And again, today we want to look at pray, P-R-A-Y. We want to look at pause and rejoice. Pause and rejoice. I was talking to one of my mentors this past week, and he was telling me a story about a movie called The Darkest Hour. And it's actually about World War II and Winston Churchill and there's a lot to the movie, but one of the scenes is actually Winston Churchill, who is a, uh, a political and military leader in, in, uh, in England at the time of World War II. He's actually talking to the king, and Winston Churchill was a renowned drinker, and the king actually asked Winston Churchill, he said, um, how, how did you get so good at drinking? And Winston Churchill said, it's simple, practice. And I think that's a hilarious kind of analogy. And of course, uh, Ephesians 5.18 says, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. Instead, get drunk on the spirit. So I think the principle is the same as Winston Churchill would say, how did you, the king would say, how do you get so good at drinking? And Winston Churchill said, he said, practice. It's like, how do you get so good at prayer? How do you get so good at being filled with the spirit? It's like practice. That's how it works. Keep it simple. Keep it real. Keep it real. Keep it simple. Keep it up. Pray, P R A. Why? So today I just have two points for us. It's P and it's R. It's pause and rejoice. And so there's, this is not going to be a teaching where we're we're like, you know, all these different points and all these different thoughts It's going to be two simple points. And what I'm going to do, so I'm going to do my very best to give you some illustrations and some scriptures for each of these two ideas. And my prayer and my belief is that the Holy Spirit is going to breathe on something this morning as we talk about these two very simple ideas and that he is going to give you something that either establishes you or inspires you or challenges you. And I really believe that that's going to happen. So let's jump right into this today. And I'm going to give you, again, the two points is pause and rejoice. That's the two points today. So first one is pause. When we talk about prayer, P-R-A-Y, we talk about pausing. Now, a lot of us, when we go to prayer, we... um, we don't think about pausing first. We think about prayer being something active. And there is an active part of prayer, but the first part of prayer, often the best way to get into prayer, to really practice, to really start to get better at discerning God's voice and being with God is actually to pause, to actually just simply stop. Isn't that simple? It's just just really simple. It's just, just stop. And I don't want to overcomplicate this. Here's how, here's how complicated it is. Stop. Just, just stop, just stop the world, stop your world, stop the noise, stop all the things that are going on. Psalm 46, 10 says this, says, be still and know that I am God. Be still, stop, just stop, just be still, just pause, just pause. There's a, uh, an analogy from a book that I read called How to Pray by Pete Gregg, and uh, I'm actually leading a group on it in the fall. So if you're interested in, uh, in that, you can actually join right on our e-groups page. Really excited about that. It's going to be great. 
And you can join that, by the way, from wherever you are. So you can do that from online. I'd love to uh, have you join our group. Uh, we also will be meeting in person, but we'll do that together at the same time. So if that's something you're interested in and you're part of our online family, man, uh, would you go to our eGroups page, dlm.church backslash eGroups, look for tw- look for how to pray and uh, sign up, man. Get involved. <laughs> uh, get in the group. We, we'd love to do it. It's going to be, uh, uh, I believe, uh, Tuesday nights, if, if my memory is serving me correctly, but it's, it's, on the, uh, it's on the sheet. You can check it out. But uh, just so back back to our teaching here, just just stop, just just stop it. And in this book, How to Pray, there's an analogy of uh, one of the little sub chapter headings is the greyhound and the wild dog eating chair. And P. Gregg is telling a story about how he was down in an urban center one time and he saw this greyhound whip around the corner running like at full speed, you know, tail, tail back, wh- whipping through, just this greyhound is booking it. And he's booking it. And as he comes around the corner, there's a leash and it's tied back to a metal chair, uh, a bistro chair. And as the dog is running, this bistro chair is skipping along the pavement behind the dog. And each time the dog pulls, it pulls the chair and it makes a noise and it freaks the dog out and the dog runs faster, which pulls the chair faster and makes the chair make more noise, which freaks the dog out more and makes it run faster. And if you can envision the way that it started, right, is the owner probably hooked the dog to the chair and maybe went in to get a coffee. Uh, The dog moves just a little and the chair moves just a little but enough to kind of spook the dog. And so the dog jumps and the chair jumps and the dog kind of makes a move and the chair makes a move. And the next thing you know, the dog starts running and the chair starts running after the dog. And that's where you get the idea of the greyhound and the wild dog eating chair. And here's the idea is that if the owner were able to talk with the greyhound, it might say something like this, hey, dear greyhound, just stop running and the chair, the wild dog eating chair will stop chasing you. And the greyhound would probably respond something like this, fat chance. I'm not going to stop running. I've got to keep running or this thing is going to eat me. But what the dog doesn't know, and actually if you apply this to our life, what we don't often know is that actually stopping actually stops the chair. And as we kind of live our lives, you guys, we are living at breakneck speed. We've got phones and emails and we're connected and, and we've, got, we've got school and we've got work and we've got families and we've got on and on and sports and on and on and on. And we have speed and we are running, many of us at breakneck speed, and we've got the wild human eating machine that's chasing us. And we don't know how to stop. And every time we move a little faster, it moves a little bit faster. And we are terrified of being eaten by this thing that's following us. But if our owner, if our, if our God would speak to us, I think he would say, hey, just stop. If you just stop, the world actually, it, 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 the wild eating part of the world, it stops with you. And you say, fat chance. I'm not stopping. There's no way I can stop. But the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I'm God. The Bible says every seventh day, take a Sabbath and shut your productivity off and trust that God meets your needs. The Bible says that you should give of your income and trust God to meet you financially. See, these are not money and time and energy. These are not math issues. These these are obedience issues. And yes, they involve math. Yes, it involves time and speed. And, And you know, when we look at our life and we say, I just need to stop, but I can't stop. It's not a math issue. It's not a, not a calendar issue. We, we can get better with our calendars, but it's an obedience issue. My pastor says this. My pastor says, when, the, when you quiet the voice of the world, the voice of God, which has been there the whole time, gets really loud. And so the first thing that we want to learn about prayer, when we learn about how to pray with P-R-A-Y, is we want to pause. We want to stop. We want to, the greyhound needs to stop to stop the wild dog eating chair. And we have to stop to keep the things from the world that are eating us from chasing us. And you say, well, Pastor Scott, that's a great idea. But, you know, your pastor says, well, when you stop, then God's voice gets really loud. And, you know, that just isn't how it works for me. God's not available to me like that. Uh, You know, you're a pastor. God's not available to me like that. Well, here's the first thing. Through Jesus Christ, yes, absolutely, God is available to you like that, okay? But I want to flip the question on its head a little bit and challenge you and challenge myself with this is maybe God's available to, to us. Maybe God is available to us. Maybe we're not available to God. And, and some of us, we can't figure out how to stop long enough to actually be available to the God who's already speaking and wants to be with us. What if I'm not available to God like that? It's not that he's not available to me like that. It's that I'm not available to him like that. Revelation 3.20 says, uh, God speaking to the church. He says, here I am. 
I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with that person and they will eat with me. That sounds like an invitation and that sounds like he's gonna be available. He's knocking. He's just, he's there just knocking at your door and he's knocking and he's knocking, but you have to stop what you're doing and you have to pause long enough to go to the door and actually open the door. You gotta pause, you gotta stop, right? We gotta pause, we gotta stop. It's prayer, P, pause. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's when we draw near to God, he promises that he will draw near to us. So it isn't that God isn't available to us like that. It's that often we're not available to him like that. And, and to be available to him, I think what the first step is to stop, to pause. There's a story that I've shared before, but it's uh, from a gentleman named Russell Cromwell. He's, uh, he, uh, sorry, Conwell. He was the founder of Temple University, uh, here in the U.S., and he was traveling through Iraq in the 1870s, and he heard a story that he shared at many speeches at Temple, and uh, this is the story that came from Iraq. He, there was a, a farmer named Ali, uh, Ali Hafed, and he owned a farm, and there was a priest that would come and visit him at the farm, and they would talk about life, and one day the priest came and actually started sharing stories from faraway lands about diamonds, and he was sharing stories from Palestine and Europe about these diamond mines where people would find diamonds that would actually bring them wealth and prosperity. And he began to talk to Ali about it and Ali would listen. And, and over time, as they would discuss these diamonds, among other things that they would talk about, Ali started getting discontented in his heart. And to make a, a long story really short, um, Ali eventually became discontented to the point that he sold his farm, left his family, and went looking for diamonds. He traveled to Palestine and to Europe, and he spent all the money that he had in order to try to find these diamonds. And he eventually uh, lost his health, he lost his wealth, and he eventually dejected, threw himself into the ocean. It was a suicide story, and um, a really, really sad, tragic story and tra tragic end. The priest continued to make his rounds to the farm and the new farm owner who had purchased the farm from Ali, uh, one day as the priest comes in, the new owner had a huge clear rock sitting on the mantle. And, uh, and the priest said, you know, hey, what's going on? Where, where did this rock come from? And the new farm owner said, oh, I dug it up in the field in the back. I was back there just playing some stuff and there was this huge rock and it kind of looked cool. So I grabbed it and I threw it up on the mantle. And the new uh, farmer had these large clear rocks on his fireplace. And um, if you actually follow the story, it was a large diamond. And the farm that Ali sold was actually a farm called Golconda, which is the world's largest diamond mine. If you know anything about diamonds, which I know very little, but uh, I do have Google, so I researched, is the Blue Hope Diamond is 45.52 carats and reportedly came from this farm. The, the Orlov Diamond is 189.62 carats and it reportedly came from this farm. And the Great Mogul Diamond is 280 carats. That's a huge diamond and came right out of this same area, this same farm. So what's the point, Pastor Scott? The point is this, is that Ali went looking for something that was actually already in the soil that he owned. He went looking for something that he already had access to. The diamonds were available to him. He just wasn't available to the diamonds. And I think that for us, our life is a little bit like that. It's like we've got access to God, the creator. We've got access to this incredible, this incredible wealth, this incredible prosperity in our own backyard. We've got access to God. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. He says, knock and if I am knocking and if, if you'll open the door, I will come in and I'll dine with you and I will be with you. Be still and know that I am God. And we say, well, I just don't know how to do that. And God's not available to me like that. What if he is? And what if we're just not available to him like that? What if the riches of God are already available to us in our own backyard and we're just not available to him? The diamonds were available to Ali, but Ali was not available to the diamonds. And you guys, this is the fight of our life, is to make ourselves available to God. And we start that by simply pausing. How do we slow down the craze of the greyhound and the wild dog eating chair? How do we slow down the craze of life? You just have to choose it and you just have to stop. Remember I said, we're not gonna overcomplicate this. This is very simple. It doesn't mean it's easy to do, but it's very simple. Stop, just stop. And so some practicals around this, we can stop and we can, we can breathe. This is not like far East, uh, you know, meditation. This is what could be more simple than simply breathing out of the lungs and breathing the air that God has given us is to just breathe. 
And sometimes just to stop, just to breathe, just helps you pause and center. Center yourself. Breathe deeply. Stop. Work on displacing the distractions in your head. And I promise you, as you pause, as you stop, the world is going to come blitzing and blazing at you. All the stuff that you've forgotten, all the stuff that needs to be done. This is the fight of our life, you guys, is to be available, to be present, to be available. And so learning to displace distractions and learning to focus. And uh, I I love an analogy that Pete Gregg shares. He said he likes to picture it like he's in a a fishing boat on a lake and everything is serene and steel and then a a still and then a speedboat comes along and the wake of that boat comes and actually starts to rock his fishing boat. He said, that's the moment where it's like when you're pausing and you're trying to pray and it's like you're trying to be still and serene and all of a sudden something comes zooming by and it just rocks around and the wake is just shaking your boat. But he says this, he says, but just like that analogy, if you will just wait and be still pretty soon, everything calms back down again. And so when those boats come by, when the concerns and cares of life come by, you just wait, recenter yourself breathe a little bit, displace distractions, and focus on being present with God. And you know, this is really big. Um, you, you, some other simple things we can do, we can just say a simple prayer that doesn't require our minds to come up with a bunch of things, but just to help us center. There's a Franciscan prayer. It's a famous Franciscan prayer. It's my God and my all. To just pause, to stop, to breathe deeply, to stop the wild dog eating chair and say, my God and my all, I'm here to meet with you. I'm here to become aware of your presence, God. God, I invite you into this space. God, I want to be present with you. To sit on that boat and to let the wake of life just chill, to pause, to stop. Again, very simple idea this morning, but um, something we need to practice something we need to work on. And I wrote a couple questions down. You know, some people might be like, well, Pastor Scott, I don't have time. I mean, I have all these pressures and responsibilities. And can I just first validate you? I, you probably do. You probably have tons of pressures and responsibilities. We all do. And that varies by season, right? I mean, that, that varies when you're a student, that looks like something. When you're a young parent and you have toddlers running around or babies crying in the middle of the night, that looks like something. You know, when you're, um, when you're in the prime of your career and you've got work demands and that looks like something. You know, all, all, of, this, all, all of the seasons of life have different demands and different time schedules. But here's something I was thinking about is that G- there was, there's no one who's ever been busier than Jesus. There was never anyone who had more demands on their time and their energy than Jesus. He, he was literally, when he would wake up in the morning, he would try to go to places and there would be crowds that would flock around him. He was literally surrounded. The Bible actually, he says, he says, basically, I have no home. I have nowhere to go. I have nowhere to lay my head in peace. Jesus was constantly bombarded by the demands of the world. He was constantly bombarded by the enemy of our souls. Jesus had more pressure and responsibility than you and I will ever know anything about. But when you look at the life of Jesus, what you see is that he would actually find ways to pause and then to seek God. If you think about the morning time, in Mark 1.35, it says this, it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and he went to a solitary place where he prayed. That's the morning. If you think about like the, the, the daytime, the, the evening, in Matthew 14, 23, it says after he had sent the crowds away, so at the end of a long day, it said he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there all alone. And if you think about the nighttime, um, in Luke 6, 12, it says, uh, one of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. So whether you think about the morning or the daytime, evening or the nighttime, Jesus, there's never been anyone who had more demand and pressure on their life, not you and not me, than Jesus. And Jesus still in the morning and in the daytime, in the evening and in the nighttime found ways to pull aside and to be with God because we tend to make time for what is most important. You say, Pastor Scott, you can't make time. That is actually true. It's probably a bad way to say that. Let me say it like this. We can't make time. We can only spend time on what matters most. And Jesus found a way to do that. And that's a challenge for us because through our demands and through our pressures, we find time for the things that matter most. And I would say pausing to center and to be with God, there's nothing more important than that. 
Maybe another question you have or another challenge that comes up for you is something like this. You Pastor Scott, I'm terrified to stop. And if we're really honest with ourselves, for some of us, we're just afraid to be alone in a room and actually think, to actually slow down because we're afraid of kind of what's going on on the inside of us. Many of us, we may not even know what's going on on the inside of us. And if we're honest, we are afraid to stop. And this is a well-documented thing. This is not just, if that's you, that's not just a you thing. Um, there's actually a study done in 2014 at the University of Virginia. And it was a study published in uh, Science Magazine. And it, it said that, I'm just going to read you the little kind of tagline from it. It says, a study published recently in Science uh, showed that people de detest being made to spend six to 15 minutes in a room by themselves with nothing to do but think. Check this out. Even to the extent of being willing to give themselves mild electric shocks instead. And what they did is they, they put people in a room and they basically, you know, let them be in there. And they said, you can just sit here and think, or, Hey, there's this little machine over here that gives you like little shocks and it'll stimulate you. If you, if you get bored, you can kind of shock yourself with this thing over here. And what they found out is that for a lot of people, they would rather actually cause themselves a mild amount of pain than actually sit in a room for five to 15 minutes with nothing to do, but think. I think that's fascinating. And I think that that is a well-documented thing. And, and I think that for a lot of us, we can be afraid to be in silence and solitude. That's a scary place for some of us. So we would rather just whenever there's a pause or a lull in the conversation, a pause and a lull in our life, whenever we're sitting for a period of time alone in a car or in a classroom or, or whatever at our desk at work, we'll just pull out our phone or we'll pull up our computer or we'll scroll or we'll listen to something or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But what about just pausing? What about just stopping? We say, oh, I, just, I don't have time to stop. Oh, well, you might. You might have more time than you think. You might just be afraid to stop. Maybe you're just afraid to stop. In a book called The Emotionally Healthy Leader, it says this, many people are terrified of what they will find inside themselves if they slow down. The terror of stopping reveals their emptiness and need. French philosopher Blaise Pascal uh, a long, long time ago said this, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Here's the idea, you guys, is a lot of times to use another analogy. If we're driving a car and there's a clunk in the engine and we don't know what that is, rather than pull the car over and actually explore what's going on or to get some help to explore what's going on, which in my case, I would probably need to do because I'm not really a car guy, um, Instead of doing that, what we do is we just turn the radio up and we just drive a little bit faster, roll the windows down, and we just book it, baby. And can I just tell you something? That is not a path to car health. That is not the way you help a car run well. And it is not the path for life health either. We have to pause. We have to stop. And we have to have the courage to humbly assess what's actually happening on the inside of us. And it starts by sitting alone, quiet in our rooms pausing. Just pause. Just stop. Be still and know that I am God. I want to give you one more analogy and we'll click to idea to you for this morning. But um, if you've ever had a dog or been around a dog and you've played fetch, you know how this works. There's a ball or a stick and the master will grab it and throw it out and the dog runs and grabs it and brings it back drops it and the master picks it up and throws it out again. That's how the game works. But uh, my dog and a lot of other dogs too probably they have this habit of not dropping it. So I'll throw a ball or a stick or whatever, and my dog, oftentimes, she will run out and she will grab that thing right away. She's good with the run and the grab. She's got that. And then she runs back, but then she'll get about five, seven, ten feet from me, and for whatever reason, she starts to veer off. And a lot of times she'll veer off and just start chewing it, start wrestling with it, start throwing it around. And the challenge is that when she doesn't bring it back and drop it, I, as the master, can't pick it up and throw it out again. And so we have this relational game that her and I like to play, but she breaks the game when she doesn't drop it. And I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you and I hopefully inspire you that unless you bring your life back to God, to the master, and you drop it, he can't kind of pick it up and kind of throw the next adventure out. That's how that works is you, you, you run with the game that the master, you, you, you partner personally, you, you have this intimate thing that's happening and then you go out and you grab it and then you bring it back and then you drop it. And if you don't drop it, if you don't stop, if you don't pause, none of it works. 
There's no more adventures. There's just running. Just running and running and running. And if you're a greyhound running with a chair chasing you, wanting to eat you. So here's the deal, you guys. Stop. Just stop. Pause. It's not a math issue. It's an obedience issue. Be still and know that I am God. Pause. Stop. Stop the dog eating chair from chasing you. Be available with whatever you have, wherever you are. Drop it. Learn silence and solitude. Turn off your phone. Turn off the scroll. Spend the time on what matters most. Drop it. Pause. Be still and know that I'm God. So that's the first point is pause. Number two is this is rejoice. Rejoice. And I love Pete Gregg. He says this. He says, hey, after we've paused, we move into rejoicing. And he said, this is like where a salmon swims or a horse runs. This is what we were made to do is to rejoice with God and to rejoice in God. In Philippians 4, 4, it says, it says, rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord again. I will say rejoice. And prayer is deeply personal. And we rejoice with God. We rejoice over who he is and what he's done, who he is and what he's done. We worship him. We adore him. And this is the part of prayer that I think for even for myself, maybe I didn't understand for a long time, but it actually was kind of the pathway to open up so much of the joy of prayer. And I'm still learning this, but um, so much. Dutch Sheet says this. He says it like this, talking kind of about this idea. He says, I attended God's house, but I didn't know God personally. We referenced going to connect to God's church, but I had never connected to his heart. I had known the promise of religion, but never the pleasure of his company. Isn't that great? Don't you love that? I had known religion, but never the pleasure of his company. I was not a hypocrite. I simply didn't know how to connect with God in a personal way. Do you know that making a list of requests and pitching them at God is not a personal relationship? That's called the transaction. And we make prayer so transactional, but prayer really is meant to be personal and intimate. It is about rejoicing. It's about adoring and worshiping. And why do so many of us feel that our prayer lives are not personal, that they're transactional? Why do we feel like this? It's because we don't understand this step. We don't understand rejoicing, adoration, worship. It's the personal part. You guys, it's the personal part. I remember uh, years ago when I was um, working, I was selling software Grab some water. I was selling software and I was traveling around the country and um, uh, uh, not all the time, but I, you know, I do some different trips and stuff whenever we'd close sales. And, and uh, I remember I would always try to get my kids a toy. Whenever I would travel, I'd always try to get them something. And, and sometimes if it was a really busy trip, that actually meant going to Myers in Okemos before I went home. <laughs> um, but I would always get them something from the trip. You know, uh, I would always try to get them something at the place if I could. And, uh, and then when I would come home, it became a thing and they got used to it. And whenever I would come home, inevitably my kids would run up and they would, what did you bring me? What did you bring me? What did you bring me? And I, you know, I didn't mind it. I actually loved it. It was a great kind of fun thing that we got to do. And, and, uh, one or, you know, one or two, or sometimes all three of the kids would come up and they would grab the toy and they'd head off to play. What did you bring me? And I'd open it up and I'd give it out and they, oh, this is so great. And whether it was a, a, a little stuffed toy or, or a game or whatever, a pair of socks, whatever it was, a t-shirt, a hat, uh, they would just take it and they would put it on or they'd play with it or they would, and they'd run off and they loved what I brought them. They'd grab the toy and that, and that was great. But every once in a while, one of them would kind of pause and they would lean in and instead of grabbing the toy, they might grab me. And, uh, and I remember one time when one of them, on a, after a long trip and I'd been gone a while, they didn't grab the toy. They grabbed my leg and they leaned in and they hugged me. And I don't remember exactly what they said, but something like, Daddy, I'm so glad you're home. And I will tell you this, that in that moment, they were not any more my kids than the other kids who grabbed the toys. I love all, they, I didn't love that kid any more than I loved the other kids. But there was a moment of intimacy between a father and a child that didn't happen with the others in that moment. And all of my kids are my kids and all of my kids are loved, but that act of unnecessary affection, it ministered to me and it, it became personal and it became personal for them too. And there was a moment of relational intimacy, not just transaction. And I want you to think about prayer like that. 
Yes, there are things we exchange. Yes, there are things that are gifts from God. But really, the, the goal and the key and the most beautiful part of prayer, where a salmon swims or a fish runs, a human worships. We adore and we rejoice in God and who he is and what he's done for us. And that day, my child experienced a greater intimacy with me. And I think we have the opportunity to do that with God because the best prayers, the best prayer times are not transactional. They're personal. P. Greg says it like this. He says, prayer is relational, not transactional. Most people's biggest issue with prayer is God. <laughs> Most people envision him scowling, perpetually disapproving, disappointed, and needing to be placated or persuaded in prayer. If that's how you picture God, I really don't blame you for trying to avoid his gaze. Jesus, however, makes it clear in the parable of the prodigal son that God is, drumroll please, on our side. And here's the deal, you guys, is that prayer is, it's, it's intimate and it's relational. It's not just transactional. Matthew 6, 9 says this, this then is how you should pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father, every bit and breath of prayer is based and rooted in the idea that we start with this intimate, personal exchange of our Father in heaven. Your name is so holy. Your name is so good. God, I just stop and I just... Remind myself who you are, God. You don't need to be reminded. You know who you are. God, I remind myself who you are. God, you are my peace today. God, thank you for being my healer today. God, thank you for coming and finding me and rescuing me. Thank you for being my salvation today. God, you're my shepherd. God, you're my counselor. God, you are my comforter. God, you're the one that sticks closer than a brother. God, you're my banner of victory that goes before me. You, you prepare a table where I can eat and enjoy sustenance in the presence of my enemies. God, you lead me beside still waters and you make me to lie down in green pastures. God, you restore my soul. God, thank you for restoring my soul. You see how we can just start to rejoice. We can start to be thankful for the blessings that he's given us. God, I just thank you today for my family. And God, I thank you for giving me the greatest woman on the planet to be married to. God, I thank you for her. God, I bless her today. God, I pray that you will show her where you're working today. God, that you'd breathe over her life today. God, thank you for my wife. God, I thank you for my kids. On and on, you guys see how this works. This is where a salmon swims and a horse runs. This is where it isn't just transactional, it's actually personal. And this, you guys, is really the most fun part of prayer. And it's the part that we so often just skip over. It's a P-R-A-Y, it's pause, rejoice, and we get to the ask and the yield so quick, don't we? Again, Pete Gregg, who I'm quoting a lot today, but he says, these are the moments where we swap the microscope for the telescope. And he said, we, we look through microscopes in our own life and the details of our own problems, and we get really bored down into the details. But he says, but sometimes to pull back from the microscope and to open up the telescope and to look at the vast array of the stars and the galaxies. And he said, there's no one ever looks at the stars and thinks, aren't I great? And so these are the moments in prayer, this rejoicing times where we step back and we say, you are God and I am not. I honor you. I worship you. God, you are so good to me. God, you've been so faithful to me. And to enjoy those moments of reminding myself where he's been good and where he's been faithful. I put down my list and I enjoy his presence. I don't just know about religion. I learned the pleasure of his company. I enjoy who he is and I rejoice over what he's done. I was kind of thinking about this the other day, and uh, one of our extended family members just went on the first date, and uh, it was really fun, and you know, they're getting older, and they went on a date, and I, didn't, I heard the date went well. I didn't hear all of the specifics of the date, so this isn't like really something that happened on the date, but I was just thinking about dating. And, uh, and I, I was thinking about how dating is relational, especially on the front end, like, um, I mean, it's relational. I mean, marriage is incredibly relational, obviously. It's just, but there's something that happens on the front end of dating, isn't there, where we have this like adoration thing that we do. And, and uh, this is a cheesy example, but just even something as simple as like, I like your shirt. And of course, on a date, you probably never really say that to someone because that would be a terrible uh, dating line. Like there, that's no game. I mean, there would be no game to that. Uh, my wife reminded me, we were talking about this and she was like, someone made a joke or cracked a joke about that. Um, but, but stay with the analogy. I like your shirt. We say things like that. That we might not say exactly that. Something like, I like your shirt. I like your hair. Hey, 
Um, I like the way you just, I like the way you treat your parents. I like your car. I, I like whatever. And can I remind us that that's just an adoration? And we, we know how to do that with dating, right? We know how to do that um, with a mentor. We might say, man, you've, you've impacted my life so much. The book that you wrote, you said this and this and this, and that just really impacted me. And I wanted to let you know, thank you for your investment in my life. And we know how to do this adoration, this thing of remembering and rejoicing over things. Don't we? we know how to do this, you guys. Come on, we can do this. It's personal. It's I like your shirt. And so what if we just talked to God like that? What if, what if we said, God, I like your, I like your joy. God, thank you for your joy. God, joy looks good. And God, I thank you that your joy is available to me, that it's a fruit of the spirit and I don't have to conjure it up, but I just get to stir it up on the inside of me. God, thank you for your joy today. God, I thank you that wherever I go today, God, I'm just gonna carry your joy. God, thank you for Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving me your joy today. God, I rejoice over that. And I'm thankful, God, that no matter my circumstance, I can have joy in you today because of who you are and because of what you've done for me. Just rejoicing. I like your shirt. You guys, this is, again, not complicated. Simple ideas, simple ideas. I like your joy. God, I like your peace. God, I like your faithfulness and your goodness. I like the way you push through the fault to the need, the way that you pursued me, the way that you came and rescued me. God, thank you for being my savior. Do you see how this goes, you guys? It just goes on and on. And all through the Bible, we see this. In Acts 4, 23 through 31, Peter and John are actually brought before the council, and they're actually kind of basically told, don't talk about Jesus. And it's like a big deal, and they they're actually end up getting released, and they come back with all the other brothers and sisters, and, uh, and it's like, you would think about, like, well, what do we do now? Like, okay, so we were just told not to preach about Jesus. We know we got to preach about Jesus. What do we do? And if in, in the Western modern church, and in, in my world, we would, we'd create a strategic plan, and we'd maybe put, put hey, we're going to do this, and we're going to say this, and we're going to, you know, I'm just having fun, and we're going to make flyers for that, and, you know, it's, hey, they, they pray, they pray. And actually you can read about it in Acts 4, 23 to 31. And what's interesting about the prayer is that 74% of the prayer that they pray is actually just giving thanks, not asking for help. So in a moment where they actually probably really needed help, they just thank God for his faithfulness and his goodness, 74% of their prayer. And can I just, something Pastor Chris Hodges has said frequently is if you, um, he wasn't talking about pray, P-R-A-Y, like rejoice, but he was talking about this kind of prayer, this kind of intimate back and forth with God where you're rejoicing over him. He said, if you don't ever get any further than that in a, in a session of prayer, you, you've done good. You've done well. That's good prayer. Just this right here. It's when a salmon swims and a horse runs, we adore and we worship. Matthew 4, 19, Jesus says this, come follow me. So when he calls out to his disciples and he says, come follow me, he's, he doesn't say come follow a plan. He doesn't say come follow uh, an agenda. He doesn't say come follow a prayer pattern. He says, come follow me. It's personal. It's not transactional. And, and you guys, we need to continue to learn that in our life. I wanted to share another story. Um, this is actually a famous painting by uh, um, an artist named uh, Filipino Lippi. And it actually hangs in the National Gallery in London. And he's uh, got a lot of famous paintings. And this particular painting is the Virgin and Child. It's the Virgin Mary with Jesus with two saints kneeling down, St. Jerome and St. Dominic. And it's kind of considered one of his second class paintings because a lot of the um, the, the perspectives are off. Like it looks like the mountains are going to topple kind of out of the picture. And it's just kind of some of the, the spacing is odd and and so uh, even though it's in a kind of a big gold frame and it's, and it's, it's put, put there, it's, it's still kind of considered one of his lesser works. And there was a famous art critic, uh, a renowned art critic named Robert Cumming, who was actually looking at the picture one day and he was noticing just the odd perspectives. And he had an epiphany that, that when it was painted by Lippi, it was not painted to hang in a gold frame in an art museum. It was actually created as an altarpiece in a church to be actually at an altar where there was a certain position to the perspective. And so uh, in his suit and kind of in his dignity, Robert Cummings actually got down on his knees and looked up at the painting. And when he got down on his knees and looked up at the Virgin and the child from a different perspective, from a perspective of, of if you will, rejoicing and reverencing and honoring, when he, when he changed into that perspective, everything, all, all of the, the mountains and everything came, came into perfect alignment. And he realized that it was actually painted to be viewed from that position. 
And I love that story because our lives were not created to be viewed from the perspective of our situations without God. That's not how our lives were meant to be viewed. The, the mountains are going to look odd. All the perspectives are going to be a little off. And you can put it in a gold, you can put your life in a gold frame and you can hang in an art gallery. And you can say, that is the jam. That's really good. But the thing is, is that our lives were not created by God to be viewed from the perspective of our situation with that microscope. It was actually, our lives were created to be viewed from the perspective of who he is and who I am in him. And when we change our perspective and our posture, and we actually, instead of looking dignified in the art gallery, looking at the masterpiece of our life, we actually get down in reverence and honor, and we personally connect with God, our creator. We actually start to see our lives come into alignment. My personal relationship with God changes my perspective. And when I pause and I rejoice, I actually can enter into that space where my life starts to shape and form and things start to make sense. So here's some practicals is that we can read the Psalms. It's the prayer book of Jesus. Isn't that amazing that we can actually read through the prayers of Jesus? We can listen to worship music. Many of us do that and we, we worship God and we can walk around our houses and we can pray. We can pray in the spirit. We can thank him for his blessings. We talked about that a little bit earlier. We can thank God for stuff even when we're not really feeling it. And sometimes, you know, when we're rejoicing and thanking God, we may not be emotionally feeling it, but really if you think about it, if you're married and you tell your spouse you love them when you don't even emotionally feel it, sometimes that's even more meaningful is the intentionality of actually sharing with them like, hey, I just want to let you know how important you are to me today. Sometimes the lack of emotion actually makes that an even better rejoice, an even better gift. And so here it, here it is, you guys, we just rejoice. We rejoice and we thank God for who he is and what he's done. Another practical is that we can worship with others in church. And this is actually, you guys, remember Churchill? How did you get so good at drinking? Practice. This is practice. And at, in just a moment, we're actually going to move into a time of worship, and, and, I, and we're going to practice. We, you can practice rejoice, pause and rejoicing. We can practice in the church. I want to close with this scripture, John 15, 4 through 5 and verse 9. It says this, remain in me as I also remain in you. This is Jesus talking. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse nine, as the fathers loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Remain in my love. And that's the rejoicing, you guys. Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always again, I say, rejoice. Remaining in his love, that's how we rejoice. We enjoy not just religion, but the pleasure of his company. So you guys pause, P, and rejoice, R. That's the first two steps of a prayer pattern that's been really helpful for me personally. And as we continue to do this, guys, we want to keep it real, keep it simple, keep it up, and we want to continue to practice. Let me pray over us this morning. Father, thank you. God, we just pause even now. We pause and we take a deep breath. And we, we humble ourselves in your presence. We remind ourselves that you're God and we're not. We center ourselves and we just focus on you. God, we thank you for who you are. And God, we rejoice over you today. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you created everything. God, you created us. You created the breath in our lungs. You created the lungs that breathe the breath in and out. God, you, you made all things and you made everything. God, you made the stars and the galaxies that we dwell within. So God, right now, we just, we leave our little microscope behind and God, we put the telescope on our eyes. And God, we thank you for being our creator, for making us, for for forming us, for breathing life into our lungs. God, we thank you today. God, we rejoice over the fact that it's in you that we live and move and have our being. It's your spirit that animates us and brings life. God, we thank you that you're a life-giving God. You're not a God who just demands from us, God. You are a God who actually supplies for us. God, we thank you for your supply today. God, I rejoice over your supply today, that you're a God that didn't create everything and spin it all up and then kind of stand afar off with your arms crossed. But God, you love us and God, you actually pursued us and through our own sin and our own fault, God, you came and found me. God, thank you that you're a God that sees through the fault to the need. 
And then God, then you sacrifice on your own expense in order to do something about it. Thank you for being my savior today. God, thank you for loving me right where I am. And then God, I thank you for your truth. You're, you're, you're the source of truth. God, your word says, we'll know the truth and the truth will set us free. And so God, I thank you that your truth is setting me free today. God, thank you for your truth. God, thank you that it is a, a light in the dark. And God, it is like a belt that I put on that centers me in your truth, God. Thank you, God, for, for your truth that sets me free today. God, thank you that you direct me and you guide me. God, I thank you for your direction over my life. And God, I thank you for showing me where to put my feet and where to put my hands. And God, in the places where I don't know what to do and I'm in the middle of a crossroads and I'm not sure what to do, God, you're there with me. And God, even when I'm unsure of, of, of what to do, God, I'm not unsure of victory because you are the one who meets me in that place. So God, I thank you that even right now, God, I rejoice over the places in my life where I don't know what to do, but God, I know that you do. And God, I know that you're there with me. God, I thank you that you're a God that's with me. You're a God that sticks closer than a brother. You're a God that will never leave me or forsake me. God, you're a good shepherd. And God, you care for me. God, you are my shepherd. I lack nothing. You make me to lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside still waters. You restore my soul. God, you lead me in paths for righteousness sake. God, your sake. God, I thank you for your righteousness today. God, that you're leading me in purity and holiness. God, right now, I thank you, God, for just speaking to my mind today, God. I thank you, God, that you're just writing new pathways in my mind to think your thoughts, God. God, to overcome my past and to overcome, uh, God, the lies of the enemy. God, I thank you that I will think the way you think, that I have the mind of Christ today. God, I thank you for your truth and I thank you for your direction and I thank you for the mind of Christ today that I can think the way you think and I can, I can sense what you're doing, God. God, I pray over my ears today, God, that I will hear your voice. God, you're a good shepherd and you speak to me. God, I thank you for speaking to me. I rejoice over the fact that you're a God that speaks. You opened the Bible with speaking and you created in Genesis. And God, you closed the Bible with speaking in Revelation, speaking to the churches and right smack dab in the middle in the book of John, you sent the word. Jesus for our needs. And so God, I thank you that you speak to me. And God, I thank you. I rejoice over your voice today in my life. God, my ears, I will hear you today. God, I will hear your voice today. God, I will not be led away by the voice of a stranger, but God, I will hear your voice clearly. And God, I rejoice that you speak to me and that I hear you clearly. God, I pray over my eyes today that I could see, God, that I could see vision the way that you see. God, I rejoice over your vision today. God, you have a good plan for my life. God, you have a good plan for what you want to do. And God, even when I don't understand what's happening, God, you know where you're taking me. And God, your word says that you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So right now, God, I thank you that I can see. God, I can see what you want to do. God, like blind Bartimaeus, when you said, Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? I want to see. God, I want to see you today. Father, what are you up to? Show me what you're doing. And God, I make a covenant with my eyes today that I will not look upon a maiden. God, I pray for purity. And, and God, I pray for holiness. God, I thank you that I can see today the way you see. God, I pray over my mouth today. I, I rejoice for the mouth that you've given me and God, that I can speak words of life the way that you do. God, creative words, words that bring life and God, they build up and don't tear down. So God, I thank you for the ability to creatively speak today and God, to speak life over people today in situations. God, I pray wherever I go today that I will not speak death and I won't tear down, but God, I'll actually speak life and I will build up. And God, I thank you for your words over me today. God, that I could take in and then I could share back out with other people. God, I thank you for my hands today and my feet, God, that I could put my hands to the work that you've called me to and that my feet will be led by you to the places where you're calling me. God, I rejoice today, God, that you've given me all of these things. And God, I can thank you for who you are and what you're doing. God, I thank you today. I rejoice today. God, I rejoice over all those that are listening today within the sound of my voice. God, I pray over them right now. I thank you that you speak to them. God, I thank you that you are directing them in their life. God, I come against the places of fear. God, we thank you that you're a God who's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mindedness. So I pray sound mind over us today. I thank you, God, that you gave us the ability to have sound minds, God, in the places of fear. So I pray that over us right now in Jesus' name. 
And God, I thank you for that sound-mindedness and that spirit of courage and that spirit of forward thinking. God, you have good plans for us. God, you are not done yet. God, there's breath in our lungs and there's blood beating through our hearts. And God, we are living with you, the good God who created all things and can do all things. God, when you come into a situation, everything changes. And God, I thank you for that and I rejoice over that today. God, we love you. God, we thank you for your holiness. We thank you for your righteousness. We thank you for your favor over us today. We thank you for your anointing, Holy Spirit, that ministers to us and fills us up and leads us forward and empowers us to go forward. God, you are so good. You're a good God. And we thank you for your goodness today. You're a faithful God. We thank you for your faithfulness today. God, we rejoice over you. And we thank you, God, that you've called us into your presence that through the person of Jesus Christ, we can boldly approach the throne of grace in our time of need and receive mercy. God, thank you for who you are and what you've done in us and for us today. God, we love you and we're thankful for the pleasure of your company. I just pray over anybody listening to my voice right now that doesn't know you. God, your word says that we can know you simply by confessing out of our mouth and believing in our heart, Jesus, that you are our Lord and Savior, that we can come to you and make a declaration of our life to say, I don't want to do my life alone. I don't want to look through the microscope of my life. I want to look through the telescope, God, of who you are. God, I, I want to get down on my knees and position myself before that painting, and God, where all, where all of my life begins to take shape and form into the way that you created it. So if that's you and listening today, pray this with me, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. And I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sin. And you didn't just come to forgive me of my sin. You came to make yourself personally available to me, to bring me into a new kind of life and into a new way of living. God, I surrender to that. I position myself for that today. And I call you my Lord and Savior. You are my God. And I want to live with you. Would you lead me and guide me? Thank you for leading me and guiding me. And God, today I, I want to continue to practice being with you. God, teach me to pause and teach me to rejoice. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome, you guys. What a cool morning. Hey, uh, hopefully that was ministering to you, and hopefully it also just illustrates for us as we practice about how we can do this, pausing and rejoicing. And we just did that for a couple minutes, but you can do that. You can do that all day. Uh, so I just want to encourage you guys. We're going to go into a time of worship. Just continue this on. Let's just continue to rejoice over him this morning. We love you guys so much. If you prayed that prayer with us for salvation, let us know. Element to 97,000. There's a box on there. Click that. Let us know. And you guys, let's go ahead and continue to rejoice over who he is and what he's done for us today in Jesus' name. Let's do it.